So good morning, everyone. I'm happy that we are back for another exciting session. This morning, I'm very happy to be the chairman for uh, Clive Meanwell's uh, talk, Clive trained in medicine with uh, postgraduate specialization in cancer research, clinical trials, statistics, and epidemiology. He holds an MBCHP and an MB and D cum laude degrees from the University of Birmingham in the UK. Clive is Chief Executive, Executive Chair of Population Health Partners, a global investment firm based in New York, San Francisco and London, focused on technologies which are as the drivers of common and burdensome health conditions such as heart disease, diabetes, anxiety and depression. Clive was the Founder, Chief Executive and Chief Innovation Officer of the Medicine Company, which was acquired by Novartis in 2020, and prior to that, he was a partner at MPM Capital. And before then, he held executive positions with Roche in Switzerland and in the United States. So you can see we have a very distinguished speaker here. And with that, I would like to hand over to Clive uh, for his talk entitled From Precision to Population, Harnessing New Knowledge to Reduce Global Health Burden at Scale. Please, Clive, it's all yours. Well, thank you very much, Michael, and good morning to everybody. I wish I could be in Basel with everybody, uh, but uh, obviously for reasons we all know, we're not together. But delighted to be invited to speak at CLINAM number 12. And my name is Clyde Meanwell, as mentioned. And my goal today is to talk about industrial and economic strategy uh, for precision medicine, particularly related to population health or the management of groups of patients with highly prevalent disorders, considering their economic distribution as well as their health status. You know, investments in therapeutics, uh, particularly for highly prevalent diseases, have underperformed for quite a while. Few biopharma launches hit their stated objectives. If we look historically back from 2006 for every roughly five year grouping, on this chart, the 28 launches of 2006 were traced for at least five years and found that 25% of them, a quarter of them, achieved less than a quarter of their goal or revenue in the first five years. You can see there's even a possibility here that over the sets of data for each year, it appears that perhaps underperforming launches have become more common in the biopharmaceutical industry. We build the data, we find that ultimately only about 13% of launches, that's one in seven, are actually meeting expectations of the investors and entrepreneurs who undertake them. The tendency in that time period has been to shift uh, ourselves to specialty biologics, perhaps as a consequence of disappointments with launches into larger prevalent diseases. Of course, as well, because we've been amazingly capable of unpacking various biological phenomena, including genomics during that period of time to unlock specialized diseases. My focus though is gonna be on the economic incentives. These data show the growth in the gray line of the NASDAQ biotech index for the period we're talking about. And you can see that it's been quite an impressive run. Some of course have outperformed others. But what is really striking is the shift in revenue from commonly used products, mainly chemical, chemical entities. Uh, Prilosec in 2000 was the number one selling drug in America with 6.3 billion of sales, with a series of tablets and capsules given to people with prevalent diseases such as depression, arthritis, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, and of course, GERD. In 2000, if we take the total revenue for the top 10 drugs in America and inflation adjusts them to today, 
we come to a total of $36 billion of sales that year. Only one, Procrit, erythropoietin, was a biologic. Let's move the tape forward to this year and what we expect to see. Well, instead of uh, $36 billion of inflation-adjusted sales, we will, of course, be seeing $93 billion, with, with Humira solidly at the top of the list, with approaching $20 billion of sales, and Keytruda this year, the first time we've seen an immuno-oncology agent in the top two or three, doing about $14 billion. All in all, you can see that the large, large number of these uh, products are now biologicals, and the total sales of 93 billion is approximately two and a half more, even inflation adjusted, than we used to spend. That doesn't surprise people. What tends to surprise a little more is the fact that in 2000, those drugs were applied to 112 million prescriptions or patient prescriptions in the United States. This year, that number goes down to 18 million. So we've seen a two and a half fold increase in spending, inflation adjusted, approximately six and a half fold reduction in volume. And if you multiply these and factor them, it's about a 16 to 17 fold shift in the structure of our entire industry, which I think we've seen happen quietly, but very strongly in this time period. Now, what would happen if that had happened in another industry. Let's take something common, such as the automobile industry. The most commonly sold car in the year 2000 was a Toyota Corolla. That's, that car's price in the United States in 2000, inflation adjusted to today, was $20,500. Here in 2020, the same model, almost exactly the same, and certainly the same uh, manufacturer, and still the number one selling car in the world, small car in the world, is priced at 1.04 times, that is $21,000. So we can see that another industry has improved technology while not actually improving or increasing unit price, but they have kept up volumes. If the car industry had structured itself in the way that the biopharma industry had done so, then this is what would have happened. The most commonly produced cars of today, new, would be $335,000 each, which would secure you a Ferrari 812 Superfast. There's certainly fewer cars on the road, which you could argue would solve a traffic problem but there would be insufficient cars on the road to solve any kind of transportation problem. A real shift like that would of course be stunning for the automobile industry, but it's a shift in economics that we take for granted in the biopharmaceutical industry. Now I'm here today to really suggest that global healthcare needs more Toyotas than we need Ferraris. Whilst I trained in oncology and I'm thrilled with the progress we've made in immuno-oncology and other forms of precision medicine, it could be argued that we've shifted too far away from population health in biopharma. Because if you look at what is ahead of us, of course, and this chart done in 2019 has no effect for COVID-19, the top 10 diseases of the next uh, 20 years plus are the ones we know uh, are highly prevalent. Ischemic heart disease, stroke, and respiratory infections are supposedly going to come down slightly, although you'll notice it doesn't reach statistical significance in that trend. On the other hand, COPD, kidney disease, Alzheimer's, and diabetes are set to rise dramatically on a worldwide basis. So there's a mismatch between what we're spending our dollars on or what we've been spending our dollars on and what we can anticipate in terms of future global health burden. What about the pipeline? Can we expect a correction through an improvement in the pipeline we're currently managing? The sad answer is that we probably can't. 
Here's a, an analysis we did looking at the current pharma pipeline, which is about 9,000 products, and looking at their distribution. The chart is complex. Let me talk through it briefly. In the y-axis, we have the number of assets in development that are in clinical phase one through three. For example, there are about 950 assets in development for lung, breast, prostate, and colorectal cancer. The lower axis is the disability adjusted life year burden that those diseases bring. For example, cardiovascular disease brings 130 million dollars per year. You can see the correlation is rather weak. A most striking example is to look at the level 500 assets being developed in hematology. You can barely see the dot on the screen because the prevalence of that disease of those diseases is so low. However, and the number of DALIs is really below the median. However, 500 projects are underway, which is the same number approximately as the number of projects we have in cardiovascular disease. So our industrial pipeline is somewhat skewed and may not, in fact, is highly unlikely, particularly with attrition, to deliver the kinds of impacts in population health we need. So what can we do about that? Clayton Christensen described disruptive innovation in, in the sense that going too far up market, shall we say producing too many Ferraris and not enough Toyotas is sometimes uh, less than a good idea in economic development. I believe, we believe that disruptive innovation is needed. In fact, we believe it's here already. Now disruptive innovation is needed to meet the needs of large groups who find existing solutions too expensive or too complicated. Other industries have faced these dilemmas before. We generally haven't in biopharma because of the tremendous pricing elasticity we've enjoyed in the United States. Whoever wins the election in, in, in November is unlikely to change the demand for more efficiency in healthcare delivery. Mariana Mazzucato, the professor from London, has made it quite clear that we should be looking at economic, uh, economic models which be, go beyond qualities and beyond cost effectiveness ratios. Her view, which I think we kind of agree with, is that increases in value should be reframed in terms of public health value. It doesn't necessarily have to be that the Toyota Corolla of yesterday and the Toyota, Toyota Corolla of today are different inflation adjusted prices. So we have to keep that carefully in mind. The second thing that probably we have to shift to is to bring a job to be done focus where it doesn't exist today. What do I mean by that? Well, as Vivian Lee described in her recent book, when doctors, hospitals and pharmaceutical companies uh, work to deliver care, then you start to see a different kind of industry emerging, one which is not driven by units of input and activity, how many drugs were taken, how many tablets and injections were given, but is measured based upon outputs of health. And that kind of restructuring of the way we're rewarded is here, but it's still a very slow and so far less popular process than, for example, in the United States, using oncology products in which the incentive structures are based on the total net pricing model. For example, a $250,000 product, which affords 6% spread for the people who dispense it and prescribe it. That's an incentive which might be somewhat skewed. We also think that the innovation cycle can become more efficient in, 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 a, in, a, in a crude sense. Uh, going from 12 o'clock on this cycle, we discover new technologies. We envision their use in public health or any form of uh, healthcare. We then perform the clinical trials 
and then see whether our clinical diet trial data hit the target in terms of implementation science in the real world. And then finally, we deliver the products, hopefully in a successful way to impact the change in healthcare status. Well, uh, the first two here, the, the technology discovery and the design of what it should be used for could be brought much earlier and much closer together between people who discover drugs and people who actually have to set policy on which drugs we want to use. Likewise, while phase one to three clinical testing for FDA, EMA, uh, the Swiss agencies and others is incredibly central to what we do, we tend to do it sequentially followed by implementation science in which we determine whether or not there's utility in the products we use. Our own industry is structured that way. Our R&D teams from phase one to three tend to be separate and reporting separately from our implementation teams who are performing tasks often uh, put under the title of medical marketing. Why aren't these together? Couldn't they be done at the same time? Couldn't the sequential nature of this be squished together so that things happen more quickly and data are more relevant to the real world that we live in rather than the real world data being used in some kind of promotional ploy. And finally, couldn't that delivery both wrap the product and the technologies such as digital therapeutics around it based upon the original thesis in the cycle of how the new technology is gonna have the biggest impact on health. So the first step is to commit to a jobs to be done a mindset at the system level very early in development, before FDA approval, before EMA approval, before China and Japan approved drug. Just such a project was completed in late 2019 when we were successful in devising a new kind of deal with the British National Health Service for over 300,000 patients with uh, ASCVD in which a long acting cholesterol lowering drug called Inclisran was contracted during phase two and early phase three recruitment uh, with the NHS at levels of utilization, which are probably 10 times higher than have been seen previously in the first one or two years of a launch. The deal also included a major clinical trial commitment where the NHS and the UK government would subsidize a very large outcomes trial to be performed with the product after drug approval. There was also a significant manufacturing component in this deal in which improving the efficiency of oligonucleotide manufacture would be undertaken collaboratively by a number of entrepreneurial companies, a couple of big drug companies and the British government together. A second way to solve the dilemma of poor returns on population health products is of course, to dramatically lower the time and cost of valid evidence generation. This is where it becomes very necessary to design phase two and three trials together with real world implementation data so that at the time of FDA approval or EMA approval, the data are available for health technology assessors based upon real evidence. Now, some will say, well, this is a terrible thing because uh, you know, at one point I ran Roche's worldwide regulatory department where we might have said, my goodness, if we have an adverse event during the uh, real world trial, uh, the drug won't be approved. This is probably a false defensiveness because if we have adverse events for drugs, surely we want to know what they are early in, it, in order to avoid both economic and healthcare disasters. So performing uh, real world evidence studies at the same time as phase three studies needs to be undertaken, we believe. Sweden, of course, is quite in the lead with this with their national randomized registry approaches, which are providing the kind of validity to regulatory outcomes and regulatory surrogate market data, which we haven't seen before. We need to do this more and more. 
we have to understand that evidence generation, and by that I mean both randomized clinical trials for regulatory purposes and randomized data for validation purposes and for utilization purposes should all have the same set of principles. Firstly, uh, and we see this tremendously so with, with COVID where WHO and the recovery trial in the UK, for example, are demonstrating that when we are purpose driven, we can really move quickly and with quality and with a certain amount of statistical power uh, by coming together. Secondly, we have to remember these programs are a two to 10 year lifespan built for task, multidisciplinary, tech enabled enterprise. Clinical trials are not projects. Clinical trials of the kind we're talking about are substantial organizational challenges which require strong leadership and cannot necessarily be delegated and fragmented with leadership coming from multiple avenues, including, for example, CROs. CROs are incredibly important as part of our ecosystem, but we can't delegate leadership of our evidence generation to people who are not necessarily incentivized to come forward with the kind of answers that we need. And lastly, I think we have to be willing to deliver technology and process of care changes together. We're hearing a lot about digital therapeutics at this meeting, I'm sure. We're also hearing a lot about amazing new biology at this meeting, but the two together have the greatest potency. I wanna give two quick examples, one from Yale and one from Harvard. At Yale, they demonstrated that the variability in absolute mortality across American hospitals after an acute myocardial infarction was 6%. The best hospitals had a 6% better 30-day mortality rate than the worst hospitals. That improvement couldn't necessarily be made by adding new drugs, although new drugs have improved mortality outcome in myocardial infarction, uh, each technology contributing maybe 3%, 2% at a time. But this group, run by Leslie Curry, found that we could reduce absolute mortality rates 4% through process innovation of cultural and cultural change in a hospital setting, uh, not just by technology. Similarly, Callum McRae's group at the Brigham and Harvard Medical School showed very nicely that systolic blood pressure in a, in a recalcitrant resistant group of patients could be lowered by 20 millimeters a year of, of 20 millimeters of mercury a year uh, at a total price of about $1,200 using existing conventional generic drugs, but importantly with human navigators to help difficult patients through their care experience. These are good examples where therapeutic outcomes can be improved, not just with technology, but with new processes and new behaviors. We need to incorporate them into all of our products simultaneously with that great new technology. Now, of course, at the end of the day, uh, there's a deep concern about return on capital. And a lot of the things that have driven the industry towards rare diseases from an economic point of view have been economic returns, of course. We've modeled this extensively and we believe that there are ways to equilibrate the performance in terms of return on capital from highly prevalent disease development programs and innovation cycles, as we see with today's frankly quite lucrative rare disease and uh, oncology and acute inf and, and inflammatory conditions. We take a situation where the MPV today is represented by the purple bar, these are proportional. If we take a price point for the launch of a drug, which is 20%, five times lower than the current price, that results in approximately an 84% loss of net present value or return on capital if nothing else happens. That's a reason we keep prices up. But if it was a collaborative launch of the kind that I described earlier for glycerin in the United Kingdom, peak penetration with agreement from the health provider might improve from 15 to a guaranteed 40%. The number of years to reach that peak penetration may well improve 
from an expected 15 years to an improved five years. Importantly, too, the selling general administration costs, or if you like, the marketing and launch costs of a program could potentially be reduced 10% as we harness the teaching and distributive capabilities of healthcare systems, rather than feel we have to build promotional and marketing activities in parallel to, and frankly, occasionally, in conflict with the way payers and providers want us to uh, act. If that was agreed up front, then those three steps alone could recover an NPV in the future, which is at least as good as the NPV today. In fact, we've been working on investments in areas where the NPV of this new kind of, of deal are actually two to threefold better than the existing ones. And of course, they come with a far lower level of risk and uncertainty. So we're very encouraged that this can be possible, but we believe that everybody needs to take a good look at this and perhaps the industry needs to turn around and ask itself, could we? And should we in the wake of COVID be spending more effort on large prevalent disorders, which have become so, so unfashionable in our industry at a time when we most need them? The last thing I'll say is that it won't be too bad for our image either. The ESG considerations of current modern investing and innovation are becoming more and more important. This is not a good time to ignore the demands of voters or the demands of investors, or particularly of the young people who are our future. Workplace practices and human capital need to be considered. The issues of pollution and sustainability and climate change, and above all, the values, ethics, behaviors, and quality management of our biopharmaceutical institutions is under scrutiny today more than ever. And you could argue for good reason, surely. Surely by moving back to our original commitment to population health in biopharma, we could make a difference here as well. So in summary, uh, we believe that population health performance can be improved substantially through technologies, obviously. We also think it's an essential thing. It's true that investments in treatments for population health have been failing. It's also true that authentic disruptive innovation is underway. We can produce Toyotas at very reasonable prices with superb modern technology to treat millions of people. To do that, the innovation cycle can become efficient, but we have to be courageous and bold in doing that. And if we do so, or rather when we do so, the results will include better outcomes for health, better return on capital, and frankly, a better world to live in at a more attractive industrial academic complex. Thanks very much for listening and I'm very happy to take questions, Michael. Thank you very much, Clive, for this excellent talk. We have one question that came through, which is regarding the disrupting innovation that is needed that you mentioned. It comes from Bert. How will global players in pharma get the management that in our society will allow this what would be the needed mind shift and how do we act? Well, it's tempting to think this is a generational uh, question. Um, I do believe that many young scientists that we all teach and lead uh, need to be encouraged to do this. Um, it is in a discovery lab tempting to think that we should be following the lemmings and finding yet another PDL1 inhibitor because that's what's making the money. It would be great if we could commit some of our young scientists and encourage them to look beyond the obvious and move back into these population health areas. I believe a bit that the, the COVID experience uh, is a wonderful impetus, a, a powerful driver of a desire to help the world at this level. And I think for our young scientists in particular, we should be encouraging them to look beyond the obvious return on capital uh, to, to the more population health areas. I believe young scientists uh, want to do that, and I think we will find a lot of energy from them. So I think to some extent, the leadership that we all represent has to be encouraging of new avenues for young participants in our industry. 
Thank you. Just another question came in. Uh, first of all, um, congratulations to the good presentation, which I hand, out, hand, uh, hand on here. The question is, how can precision medicine address the concern in representativeness and inclusivity in underrepresented populations in medical research advances to be applicable to populations outside of Europe and North America? Well, I, I, there's a, I didn't cover that point, but it's a very, very important one, and I'm glad somebody raised it. Uh, obviously, again, let, let, let's take the situation of uh, COVID, for example, of vaccines. Uh, excuse me. Let, let's take uh, therapeutic antibodies as, as a starting point. Obviously, there's great concern that therapeutic antibodies will only be available to the most wealthy countries uh, and even to the most wealthy patients. Here in America, we saw a, a particularly wealthy patient treated uh, quite effectively with the Regeneron uh, uh, by, by mixture, the, 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 the two antibody mixture of Regeneron. Um, I think it's necessary for us to start at the beginning and think about cost of manufacturing from the beginning. I think it's necessary for us to worry when we're designing, for example, monoclonals, to worry about drugability a great deal, to think about yield, to think about solubility, to think about uh, dose, injection volume, which so far has not been really thought much through in, 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 in the rush to get COVID monoclonals done. Uh, but we're gonna pick up the pieces afterwards, which is that uh, the manufacturing efficiency, the dosing efficiency, the distribution and uh, supply chain challenges are going to be very real, particularly in countries that, are, that do not have great infrastructure. We also can't assume that Bill Gates is going to pick up the difference between Western prices and developing prices. So we have to get cost of goods down uh, and, and so on. Now, the other way to do it, I think, is with new business models. I think it's possible for developing and, and less developed economies to be provided loans to acquire products and repay them over many, many years uh, on, on a slow uh, return basis. And it's also uh, possible, I think, uh, for the industry to start looking more and more seriously at subscription models for payments. You know, uh, we've discussed deals uh, in our company recently where, let's say, the first I'll, I'll, I'll make up some numbers. The first 100,000 patients get the treatment for, should we say, 10 Swiss francs. And after that, the next million patients get the drug for um, two Swiss francs, which covers the manufacturing of one Swiss franc plus a profit of one Swiss franc. But having made the return on the initial deal, it's possible for a subscription model to allow purchases to go way beyond the volume you originally uh, talked about, providing you're transparent about your manufacturing costs and that the incremental uh, payment is, of course, simply improving your return on capital. So I think we have to actually look at very different forms of model uh, for economic recompensation for, for, for new drugs and new, new, new vaccines. Uh, a thing that really disappointingly so far has not happened, what has been happening is that governments have been getting their checkbooks out. That's one very short term solution. It, it runs into, you know, many billions, even trillions of dollars, ultimately, in terms of what, what the public have to pay. But I think the uh, biopharma industry has to start getting more creative with the kinds of deals we construct. Uh, they're there. They can be profitable, they can be attractive to investors, which of course they have to be if we're going to have a sustainable growing industry. But I think we've been a little bit slow in thinking uh, new uh, business model, particularly for developed and developing countries. It's, it, it's doable, uh, we just have to commit to it. Thank you very much for answering this question too, which was the last question that came through. Thanks again, Clive, for this excellent talk. And with that, I would like to close the session to move to the next one. And I wish you a good continuation of the day. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
May I, as the organizer of this meeting, thank you very much, Clive. It is really, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Ah, good. It's really great that you have decided to come. We uh, hoped it and then it was possible. And we think that you have outstanding qualities and your farsight in a better society that would, instead of Ferrari, take a Toyota. I like it a lot. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you for the invitation, Ben, and well done for pulling this together under such challenging circumstances this year. Thanks. <laughs>